Hello. I'm, I'm appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that's that's been important to me for quite a while. Um, if you fear, as I do, that our use of social media may be making people and cultures shallow, then then why not teach more people um, how to swim? And together we can explore the deeper end of the pool. Uh, the way you use a search engine, um, stream video from your smartphone, update your, your Facebook status matters to you and to me and to everybody because the way we use these media today uh, and misuse them uh, are going to influence the way uh, people use and misuse these media for some time to come. Instead of asking, is, is Google making us stupid? Is um, Facebook commoditizing our privacy? Is Twitter chopping our attention into micro slices? All very good questions. I've been asking myself, how do we use social media intelligently, humanely, and above all, um, mindfully? NetSmart is, is what I've come up with in, in terms of uh, talking to people who know what they're talking about, uh, doing research, and counting on my nearly 30 years of experience online. And, and what I've, I've come up with is uh, the notion that the critical uncertainty today is what people know. It's a matter of literacy. And when I talk about literacy in regard to social media, I mean not just the skill of encoding and decoding, like reading and writing is to alphabetic literacy. I mean the skill of encoding and decoding, the fluency in manipulating the media, but also the ability to use them in, in concert with others. There's a social dimension to each of the essential literacies. And I think that these literacies point both inward and outward in the sense that the people who know how to use these media are going to do better for themselves. But I also believe that the more people who know what they're doing, the better we can improve the state of the commons, the, we can improve the quality of the information and culture online. So very briefly, the, the literacies that I have isolated, certainly not all of them, but I feel the most important ones, start with attention, continue to our participation, include collaboration, crap detection, and network know-how. Uh, I, I want to briefly touch upon each of these. Of course, I get into a lot more detail in the book, but in a few minutes here, I want to talk about attention as really the fundamental literacy in the sense that it's the, the foundation of our ability to, to think and communicate. And clearly, our attention is being challenged uh, by all the screens that uh, com compete for our attention. This, you may recognize these stills here are from a, a uh, camera in a mall in the USA, and it shows a young woman falling into a fountain while she's, she uh, is texting. And in the USA, one in six Americans have uh, confessed to, uh, admitted to bumping into something or someone while texting. And uh, having traveled, I know that this is a worldwide issue. Now take a look at this. Here's Mark Zuckerberg giving a press conference. And... Uh, there's one person looking at him, and everybody else is uh, looking at their screens. We were talking about the first of the five literacy, attention, and we're talking about multitasking. And, uh, and here's a, a multitasking student apparently does it successfully. I want, I want to emphasize that the recent research by Clifford Nass at, at Stanford has demonstrated pretty conclusively that people who think they are getting their work done more efficiently by multitasking are actually degrading their performance on the individual tasks. What was interesting to me was that uh, this is true of about 95% of the subjects studied. What about those other 5%? 
Uh, was this student one of them? And was he just born with an, an ability to pay attention to more than one thing at once? Or was it something that he had learned and something that we could learn? There is an existence proof for this kind of multitasking, and that, that is um, pilots. Pilots have to aviate, navigate, and communicate in three dimensions. And, and that's why nobody is shooting at them. So I do believe that um, one can learn to manage one's attention more effectively. And there's an old name for this, an ancient name, mindfulness. There's a new name for it, metacognition. Wikipedia has a pretty good, good page on metacognition. And it simply means becoming aware of where you are deploying your attention. So when, when I work with my students, we work on paying attention to when our minds are wandering. Um, if you open your laptop in class and you're taking notes, you're checking to see if the, the professor knows what he's talking about, fine. But when you begin sliding into Facebook or your email, notice that that's what you're doing. If you're going to do it, don't do it mindlessly. Um, I ask my students when we are studying this, to just take a few minutes to write what their priorities for the day are. Um, you can see I just uh, wrote six words here and put it in the corner of my screen. And during the day when my gaze falls upon this naturally, I simply ask myself, where's my attention right now? And where, according to my own priorities, should it be? This is just a, a matter not of policing one's attention, but of beginning to become aware of it, to train it. So very briefly, since we don't have a lot of time, attention can be trained. We know this from a millennia of contemplative traditions, and we know it from ample neuroscience today. The, 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 I think one of the best books about that is called The Mindful Brain by Dr. Daniel Siegel. Breathe. Uh, researcher Linda Stone noticed that she was holding her breath when she was doing her email. She calls this email apnea. We hold our breath when something has captured our attention and we're not sure whether it's good or bad, that's, it's the fight or flight response. If you think about your ancestors walking through the, the jungle or the savanna and they hear a sound, they freeze. Their body starts pumping hormones just in case they have to fight or flee. And they hold their breath. Well, um, that's very useful if you're trying to survive in the jungle. If you're sitting at your computer and you do this 500 times a day and there is no, uh, nothing chasing you, it's very unhealthy for you. So uh, one thing that's very easy to do when you are attending to your screen is to take a breath. Breathing connects the mind and the body. And attention to intention is how the mind changes the brain. If you begin paying attention to where your attention is, you are strengthening that part of your brain that pays attention to where your attention is. It's not that uh, we are helpless in the face of all of the distractions that media afford. It's that we have not taken, taken the time to train our attention. So I want to move to critical consumption. I call it crap detection after Hemingway, who said that every uh, a good journalist requires uh, an, a foolproof uh, internal crap detector. I started thinking about this quite a number of years ago before Google, when my daughter was um, in, in middle school and starting to write papers and going to the, the library and using a search engine. Um, search engines were called AltaVista and InfoSeq in those days. And I sat down with her and I explained that you can get a book out of the library and you know that there was a, an editor and a publisher and a librarian who all acted as gatekeepers to try to assure that the, the, uh, the, the text was authoritative, that you could trust what it said. Nowadays, of course, you can put a term into a search engine and you can get an answer to any question within seconds. But now it's up to you, the consumer of the information, to determine its accuracy. So I asked my daughter to, to put the name of um, 
Martin Luther King, the uh, uh, American civil rights leader, uh, into a search engine, search on his name, and you notice that the third link down is called Martin Luther King Jr., a true historical examination. If you click on that, you get a website that, that appears to be about Martin Luther King Jr., but if you read the, the articles, they, they, they paint him in a very unfavorable light. So um, my daughter asked, how, how can you tell um, whether this is true or not? I said, well, there's an author here. Let's search on his name. And that told us a lot. But there was no author for the website. So I showed her a site called Who Is that will tell you, if you put in a, a URL, who is responsible for it. And it turns out that someone called Don Black at stormfront.org was responsible for that website. So searching on that name, Again, this is a pretty simple procedure here. Just a little bit of investigation uh, reveals that uh, Stormfront is a white nationalist uh, community. It's what the, what's known as a cloaked website. Not all of the websites out there that, that aren't what they appear to be are, are political or cloaked. Um, this one would be uh, funny if it wasn't a little bit scary. It's the uh, a free online pregnancy test. And you know, the technology can do such incredible things these days. It's, it's easy to, to, to believe something like this. Um, so it says, fill in your name and press start test. So I, I, I put in the name Joe, and I got a little uh, flash animation come up that say, uh, sit still while we scan you. And then it turns out, uh, congratulations, Joe, you're with child. So I clicked on view my baby. Turns out it's a girl. Well, by this time, I think most people know that it's a, a joke. Um, I am concerned, though, about uh, there are a certain number of pregnancies caused every year because uh, young men and women aren't entirely sure about uh, uh, where babies come from. Um, I couldn't help clicking on one more, who's the daddy? And if you don't like the daddy, um, you can pick another daddy. This is uh, first genetics. I think actually this is in the in the UK. These uh, people claim to have tracked the genetic code, and they've got a primate that can communicate with you through a typewriter, um, through a, um, a a keyboard. It is of course completely bogus, although it looks for real. There is the endangered Pacific Northwest tree octopus, a, a, a completely non-existent species. I, the URL at the bottom of the screen there is that I, I have a long list of, of sites, some of them political, some of them jokes, um, some of them hoaxes. Um, again, very briefly, as I told my daughter, think like a, tech, a detective or think like a journalist. Don't assume that what you you find online is true. Check it out. Um, don't just accept what's on the first page of uh, search results. Don't just use one search engine. If you can find an author, look on their name. Simple, but I think um, required. Triangulation is a word that journalists use for checking three sources before you pass along a rumor. I remember in 2011 during the Egyptian uprising that there was a report on Twitter that, uh, that Egypt had shut down uh, internet access. There wasn't anything on BBC. There wasn't anything on CNN. There wasn't anything on Al Jazeera. So I did not pass that along until I got uh, three sources on it. Um, it turned out that that was accurate. Not long after that, there was a rumor that if you texted a certain number, you would help send medical aid to Haiti, where they had just had a, an earthquake. That turned out to be a hoax. So I think it's very important these days in terms of, of fast-breaking rumors on social media that we all triangulate like journalists. Um, also, I think it's very important that uh, because we have the ability to pay attention to many more news sources, that we not only pay attention to sources that we agree with. Um, if, if nobody in your network, none of the news sources that you are paying attention to annoys you, then maybe you are in an echo chamber. You need to pay attention to sources that you don't agree with, but you believe to be honest and intelligent. So participation is the next literacy, and we really wouldn't be talking about the web at all if it wasn't for participation. Uh, the web was not uh, created by a government. It wasn't created by a corporation. It was created by millions of people putting up web pages. Just very briefly, a couple of examples. Um, Heather Lover, again, I believe she was in the, the um, she was in Reston, Virginia, and um, 
she created a, a website for fans of the Harry Potter books. Uh, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, who own the copyright, tried to shut her down. They sent her a, a cease and desist order. Um, she organized a worldwide boycott that backed them off before uh, the, the Warner lawyers discovered she was 16 years old. There was um, an, an obscure blogger in the U.S. by the name of Bev Harris who discovered that the source code uh, for Diebold, the company that makes the voting machines for much of the USA and much of the rest of the world, uh, which they had been keeping secret, was on a public server. She made that information public and a court in the U.S. Uh, found in her favor. And then uh, here's Wael Gonim, one of the uh, young revolutionaries in Egypt who used Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as part of what they were doing, not making the claim here that uh, it was a Twitter revolution, but I am making the claim that, that uh, people have used uh, and are using in, in Turkey, um, in Egypt and Brazil right now, um, social media to organize and, um, and coordinate uh, political activity. Um, and of course, we're now accustomed to um, uh, teenagers inventing new industries uh, and making themselves billionaires and very powerful people from their dormitory rooms. You know, I emphasize the youth of these examples just to show that um, if you know how to participate, you can wield real power, political power, um, economic power, and cultural power. And curation is a word that's being used uh, these days in terms of people making decisions about what's good information online about a particular topic and passing their, deci their decisions on on to others, and I believe that curation is a great way for people to easily participate and um, not only increase their own knowledge but um, benefit others. And just very briefly, want to run through the benefits of it. We all need to transform information overload into useful knowledge. If we make um, something that we had to do. Um, available to others anyway, we can benefit uh, everyone and create a public good and also signal that we are people worth uh, cooperating with. It's a good way to enhance your reputation as an expert in a topic. And if everybody, if more people in a culture participates, um, we have a very different culture. A person who regards herself um, as an active creator of some of the culture that, that she consumes online, has a very different view of herself as a citizen, an active view of herself as a citizen, than someone who sees himself only as a consumer of culture that's created by others. There are so many different ways to participate. We cannot leave it just uh, to Facebook to create our content for us. We need to create, we need to participate, we need to continue to be in charge of what the, the culture on the web is. So again, don't just consume, create. Um, the web has a particular architecture that makes it easy for individuals to contribute small bits of knowledge, small bits of usefulness, small bits of helpfulness that add up to a lot for everybody. Curation is an easy way to begin practicing collective intelligence. Um, Learn the norms and boundaries of local cultures before participating. Know what you're participating in. And, and crap detect thyself before broadcasting questionable info. You know, we can't really and shouldn't really try to police the information that people put online. If that was possible, if that had been done, we wouldn't have the web. But what we can do is that we can um, make sure that the information we send out is accurate uh, before we pass along a rumor that's sent to us. There are so many ways to collaborate. I've written books about two of the different genres of collaboration. I'm not going to get into detail about any of these stories. Smart mobs, as I said, in Brazil, millions of people are on the streets in ways that they never were before because they're able to communicate with each other and to organize with, each, with, with people they weren't able to organize with in places and at paces they weren't able to organize before. I first started talking about virtual communities in 1987 to try to get across the idea that uh, it wasn't just electrical engineers who used uh, computers to communicate with. Now, of course, um, 
hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, communicate daily with people they share an interest with. If you are a, a cancer patient, if you are a gamer, if you are an educator or a student, you are probably participating in a virtual community of some kind online. People are um, putting their computing power together uh, it's called distributed computation. When your computer goes to sleep, it can take part of a scientific com computation and send the results to headquarters. If you go to folding.stanford.edu, you can help scientists understand how protein molecules configure. It's very important in AIDS research. In fact, there's even a game called Fold It on the Xbox, and a team playing that game was able to discover um, important uh, bio, uh, biomedically important facts about the protease, protease uh, enzyme. We think of crowdsourcing in terms of companies having their, their customers create their content for them. Well, this is a picture of uh, Jim Gray, who went missing in uh, the San Francisco Bay in a sailboat. His friends organized a search overnight. They got uh, 500,000, they, they got uh, images uh, of uh, the area of the Pacific Ocean where he went missing. They divided it into half a million images and they searched them. They didn't find him, but they put this together with tools that are available online um, literally overnight. Wikipedia is, is not the only, but maybe the most prominent form of collective intelligence. All of these are, are genres of collaboration. If you know the literacy of how to collaborate, how to, how to collaborate in a smart mob or a virtual community or, or crowdsource or collective intelligence, you and those you join with have abilities and powers that you would not have had otherwise. And we're now seeing this extend to learning. You know, educational institutions, Schools used to have the monopoly on learning. Nowadays, if you want to learn how to do something, whether it's how to build something out of wood or configure a computer server, there's probably a 15-year-old who's going to show you how on YouTube. Um, so again, we compete, we cooperate as much as we compete, and online literacies of collaboration enable us to participate in that. Um, Collaborative actions, um, like participatory actions, climb the curve of engagement. You start out simply, and you, can, and you get more engaged. There are a wide variety of ways to participate. And if you want to get others to participate, give them a lot of ways that they can choose to participate. You know, nobody assigns someone to write a Wikipedia article on a particular variety of ant. It's a person who uh, considers themselves an expert on that ant who does it. It's called self-election um, and is very powerful. People contribute online for a, a number of reasons. Um, survey research has shown that learning, enhancing reputation, social uh, reasons, meeting other people, and, and adding to a public good um, are all reasons why people will contribute online. And casual conversation enables strangers to trust each other enough to cooperate. So that that. Chit chat online um, that seems trivial is actually the way people get to know each other. Finally, network awareness. I know I'm aware of the, the time limit here. I'm not going to get into detail, which I do in the book. But we now live not in an information society, but in a network society. And there are a number of, of different kinds of knowledge that have emerged from network science, that have emerged from sociology, and that we're beginning to understand have a very uh, direct uh, impact on the way we spend our lives online. It's particularly important for young people who are coming online to understand that their participation online is, is, is now happening in a network society. Social networks certainly pre predated Facebook, but they're far more important today because we are able to link ourselves in ways that we were not able 
to do so before. So I know, and it's and indeed it's the connection between these different pieces of knowledge that, that create a literacy of of networks. You don't have to be a scientist to understand them. I I, I try to convey them in the kind of terms that you would convey to your your teenager uh, before they they uh, get too involved online. So in the in the interest of time, I just want to very quickly say that networks have structures. Understanding those structures um, enable you to. To know what you can do with them. Um, both strong and weak ties are useful to individuals. And it's, it, it may not be the number of Facebook friends you have. It, it's more important um, to exhibit what a social network analysts call centrality. The number of people in networks have to go through you to get to each other. Um, diverse networks are collectively smarter. Um, and people who can bridge networks um, can stand to benefit by doing that. Um, this research has not been done online yet, but it's been done in face-to-face -face neighborhoods. The strongest indicator, strongest predictor of whether you will receive favors from others is whether you do favors for them. Uh, online, you are able to do favors in a visible way. So paying it forward um, can pay you back. So. Um, in closing, um, again, I've moved through this material very, very um, quickly. Uh, don't try to keep up with just the technologies. Um, uh, keep up with the literacies. And you'll find out uh, more at rheingold.com uh, slash netsmart. So um, I think if you have time, I am happy to answer questions. Thank you very much indeed.